Hey guys, time to get in on the action for the biggest moments in basketball with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections, place your entry, and win up to 100 times your money. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use the code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. This is Scott Richmond and Arnie Sherman. You're listening to What Do You Know on News Talk KGVO, AM 1290 and 98.3 FM. Arnie Sherman, a good Sunday morning to you. Good morning to you, Scott, as always. I'm very excited about the show this week. We have uh, my longtime friend and colleague, Peter Goltz, who ran National Transportation Safety Board, coming to talk to us about all things transportation. Timely conversation, correct? Yeah, timely. You know, sometimes there's a lull in what's going on in general, but right <laughs> now with the, you know, the Boeing 737 MAX and the Japanese, you know, airliner catching on fire and, you know, this sort of stuff, it just brings back all of the, you know, issues related to air travel and air safety, particularly after COVID as people are coming back into uh, the mainstream of air travel, you know, here in Missoula, the airport's packed all the time now. Um we need to hear about what's going on and how safe things are. Do we have enough personnel? All that sort of thing. Arnie, it's one of our favorite conversations talking about air transportation. After the break, we'll be back with our guest, returning guest, Peter Galtz. Back after this. Arnie, we are back. Yes, Peter, it's good to see you here live on our it's, uh, Zoom call. It's You're good where? To see- in Alexandria, Virginia? I am in Alexandria, and it's good to see you both. And uh, I'm glad I'm here and not there, given the weather. Exactly. Exactly. Peter's a longtime friend and colleague of mine. But for our listeners who uh, don't know about you, why don't you talk a little bit about your background and your uh, leadership at the National Transportation Safety Board? Sure. I was the managing director of the National Transportation Safety Board for uh, almost six years and had a number of very high profile accidents occur on my watch, including uh, TWA Flight 800, the crash of the value jet in the Everglades, and the crash of John F. Kennedy Jr. off of uh, uh, Martha's Vineyard. Uh, We also had Egypt Air, uh, which was a pilot suicide that killed 330 people off of Nantucket. So we we, we had a busy time uh, during my, my tenure. And then I've worked in the aviation and transportation business for the last 20 years, working on both pipeline, uh, aviation, surface transportation safety issues. So tell us a little bit about what the National Transportation Safety Board does. I mean, you have when there's an accident, you have the FAA, Federal Aviation Administration involved. You have local authorities involved. But what is the role of the NTSB? Well, the the NTSB is a unique animal in Washington, D.C., in that it is an independent agency. It's not part of the executive branch. It's not part of Congress. It is independent of both of those institutions. And it's charged with only investigating transportation accidents, uh, determining a probable cause, and then making recommendations on how these accidents won't happen again. They're not an oversight agency. They're not a regulator. You know, the NTSB can't order, you know, an air carrier or a shipping company to do anything. The only thing they can do is issue recommendations, which they do. And I would say, depending on the mode of transportation, and the NTSB investigates aviation, rail, pipeline, automobiles, uh, marine, uh, and hazmat uh, transportation issues, I would guess somewhere close to 90% of their recommendations are accepted and implemented uh, by the various modes uh, uh, and the various uh, parties to the investigations. So you mentioned a couple of high-profile cases that you were involved in. Let's let's talk about a couple of them. Probably the most High profile was John F. Kennedy Jr., who uh, died in uh, July of 99 off of Martha's Vineyard. 
he was with his wife, Carolyn, I guess, and her sister-in-law, um, Lauren, his sister-in-law, Lauren. Um, he was in a Piper, right? It was It was a Piper. Yeah, it, was, it, was, it was in a Piper Saratoga, uh, yeah. which he had just upgraded to some weeks before. He had been a, a student pilot for a couple of years and had just moved up uh, to the Piper Saratoga, which is a pretty high performance uh, aircraft. And uh, he was due to fly up uh, to Martha's Vineyard and drop his sister-in-law off and then continue on uh, to Cape Cod, to Hyannisport, because the Kennedy family was having a family wedding that weekend. So, uh, and he was due to leave New Jersey uh, at about 6 or 6.30 so he could fly in daylight up to... uh, uh, up to Martha's Vineyard and then on to the Cape. So he was going to be in daylight, but uh, his wife and sister-in-law were late. And uh, they really didn't take off until after 8 o'clock. And so by the time they reached Martha's Vineyard, uh, it was dark, completely dark. And uh, it was a deceptive uh, day in terms of weather. Uh, the the weather reports for pilots that came out that afternoon showed clear weather uh, with some ground mist. Well, the ground mist was much heavier uh, and and much more tricky than uh, uh, pilots had expected. In fact, we interviewed a number of pilots who tried to make the same flight into Martha's Vineyard who turned back because uh, the mist and the... Uh, Ground cover was so heavy, they couldn't see the lights of the island. And uh, what what the NTSB determined uh, was that, uh, you know, he approached uh, approached Martha's Vineyard at four or 5,000 feet, and uh, there was no moon out that night, so there was no horizon to help him keep his plane straight and and, uh, level. And he started to uh, circle to come down to try and find the lights. And uh, he got into a, a very tough spin and couldn't recover. And part of that was because uh, he was deceived by his inner ear, you know, loss of awareness of, of what his plane was actually doing. And hmm. he was not he was not an experienced uh, instrument uh, rated pilot. He'd only, he'd only had a, a limited number of hours on instruments. And when when you're in that kind of difficulty, you really have to ignore what your sensors are telling you and believe what the instruments are showing you. Right. And, and it's, it's very hard for, for novic pilots to do that. Uh, and uh, it's the hardest thing you have to learn uh, in instrument uh, training to say, I'm going to trust, I'm going to trust my instruments. That must've been a very difficult case to handle with the fact it that was, his, uncle, it, his yeah. uncle was a United States senator, his father was president of the United States, you know. Um, it was devastating. And, you know, he was a good guy. And uh, the family was just completely devastated by the accident. You know, they were, they were due to have a, a wonderful wedding on that Saturday. Uh, it, had, it was postponed, obviously. Uh, the recovery uh, was challenging. And uh, it was it was very hard, hard on the Kennedys and hard on the Bissettes, uh, who, and, you know, Mrs. Bissett lost her two daughters and they were both beautiful and brilliant. So it was a very tough accident. Probably the most complex case you worked on when you were there was TWA 800 at JFK Airport from 1996. That was like a four year investigation of uh, of that crash where 100 how, how many people? How, how many people? Two hundred and thirty guys. People. So, yeah. what was so complex about that, and why did it take four years? Well, yeah, it it was, and it was on on top of it. Uh, in nineteen ninety six, that was the number one uh, uh, news story of the year. No other really? news story. Yeah, it was it it, it out. Uh, it was bigger than the election, the re-election of uh, Bill Clinton. It was bigger than the Olympics 
and the Olympic bombings in Atlanta, it got more column inches and more airtime than any other story in 1996. And that was and, a story uh, I recall that had a lot of conspiracy theories there were, floating around it. Right. There, there had been conspiracy. Th- there, there had been, you know, some very legitimate concerns about terrorists. Uh, there had been a bombing plot uh, at the at the World Trade Center that had gone off in 1993. Uh, there was a airline uh, conspiracy plot that had been broken up. That was uh, they were trying to blow up eight or nine aircraft transversing uh, the Pacific. There was a trial going on of Ramsey Youssef, who was one of the principal uh, planners of these acts. So it was, there was a lot of tension about the potential of a, of a, uh, uh, terrorist act. And the plane blew up at, at the beginning of its flight at about 13,400 feet. It just, uh, JFK, right? Left in That's New York. right. It left yeah. JFK, was on its way to Paris. Uh, and, uh, it had, it had come in earlier in the day from Athens. Uh, and, uh, you know, had refueled, refitted and, uh, and was taking off. And it was, uh, a lot of people saw various aspects of the tragedy, uh, because it was a beautiful day on Long Island, you know, just at sunset, the plane crashed about 8.30. Uh, there were boaters out and, uh, many people saw something going on, an explosion, the plane coming to the ground. A lot of people thought that they had seen a uh, uh, a streak going up in the sky. Uh, but on further ex- and the and the FBI, I mean, they were they were convinced that it was some sort of criminal act, and they acted appropriately but aggressively on that. We weren't so sure. Uh, you know, we had, we would have been uh, if if it had been a criminal act, the NTSB would have stepped aside. Uh, but, uh, we started to see when we started to bring the wreckage in, it was down at about 230, 240 feet of water. We had the, the U S Navy sent up two salvage vessels, uh, the grasp and the grapple and anchored off of long Island, off of Smith point park, about nine miles off of, uh, long Island and recovered, the uh, the wreckage. Eventually, we recovered thousands of pieces of wreckage, uh, and uh, by a month into it, we saw two things. One was we saw no telltale signs of an explosive event. You know, uh, if you put a bomb on a plane, if you if a missile goes off either near the plane. It leaves witness marks that are very distinct and can't be missed. We saw none of that. And, uh, and we, and what we did see was some very unusual deformations from the interior of the plane. And, and what you look for in a aviation accident in, in midair, the, the wreckage that comes off first is, is usually the most important because that's the, that's where the event started. Whatever happened started at that point. And, uh, we, we had, uh, eight or nine different radar tracks on the plane. So we knew precisely where the event started and we knew where it ended because that's, that's where the wreckage was. And it ended about 45 seconds later, the plane, uh, continued on in some flight form of flight, and then and then went went into the ocean. And Scott, I mean, when we listening to Peter and the way he lays this out, it sounds like it could be a weekly serial on uh, you know some kind of mystery story. How do you solve these things? Absolutely, yeah, I mean, yeah it'd be a good podcast. Uh, yeah. You know, but we 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 pulled out. We went down and we saw that the the initial wreckage from the plane which included the cockpit, the nose of the aircraft. It also included some pieces from the interior of the plane near the center wing tank. 
And we said, what the hell is this? You know, what's this piece doing there? And that was really the beginning of the tip off where we started focusing in on the center wing tank because we knew something terrible had happened in that tank. And uh, as time went on, uh, we reconstructed close to a uh, hundred feet of the aircraft completely. Amazing. Uh, we, we put uh, the seats back in it. Uh, we put uh, we 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 got all of the exterior skin, and we wanted to show that there was no possible place on the plane where a missile could have penetrated it, where shrapnel could have penetrated it. There was simply no evidence of an external uh, event bringing down that plane. Peter, then, how, do you, yeah. how, how do you budget for something like that? Like, what's the budget that goes into something like that? It just sounds so incredibly, not just expensive, but so detailed. And so uh, you need a lot of resources to accomplish what you just talked about. You're right. You know, the NTSB doesn't have 450 employees. I mean, we, it's a very small agency. And in, in this case, uh, and we have a, the, the agency has a small emergency fund, probably five million or so. In this case, we went to Congress, uh, with the FBI and we said, listen, if you want us to do this, it's going to take a supplemental appropriation to get it done. And Got I it. think in, in the end, uh, the NTSB received over four years about $40 million to, to, to conduct this investigation. We held a public hearing, a three day public hearing in Baltimore that was, uh, a, a, a pretty, uh, extensively attended event. And, and then we, we, it, we, we had a number of experiments that we conducted. For instance, we contacted with the China Lake Naval, uh, missile laboratory out in, out west, I think in, uh, China Lake, New Mexico, uh, and asked them to do tests on if missiles, if surface to air missiles went off near a commercial aircraft, what would, what would the damage look like? And they did. And we saw we had nothing like it. You know, we, 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 we ended up, uh, building a scale replica of the center wing tank and developing a, uh, a, uh, an accurate substitute for the jet fuel, the residual jet fuel. It was empty that was in there, but it was heated. And, and we blew it up at about, we had it up at about 10,000 feet in the mountains and, and we ignited it. And it really confirmed to us that, uh, that, that what happened was that the fumes in this empty fuel tank that had been heated by the uh, air conditioning packs running for three hours while the plane was 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 on the ground at Kennedy, heated the fumes to an explosive flammable level, and that some sort of short circuit, probably from the fuel quantity indicating system, migrated into the tank and ignited it, and it wouldn't have taken much. You know, the the very last words on the voice recorder was the flight engineer pointing out that the fuel pump and fuel indicator was acting crazy. He said, look yeah. at that, look at that, which told us that there was some sort of electrical event probably going on. You know, Peter, as you talk about all of the technical and meat and potatoes of these incidents, it's, it's fascinating. But the hardest part of the job, I would imagine, is dealing with the families. You know, yes. you had the JFK and that's that was very you know, complex and very visible. But in this case, there were several hundred families that were affected right. by this. How did you deal with that? Well, in, you know, that's, and that's a great question. Prior to 1997, there was no formal mechanism for, for us or for anyone else to deal with the families of transportation disasters. And with the advent of the internet in the nineties and stuff, they were starting to get organized. And we saw that in a, in an accident in Pittsburgh, uh, in which family members reached out to the chairman of the NTSB, Jim Hall, and asked to meet with him and be briefed by the investigation, by, about the investigation. And, uh, Hall 
you know, broach the subject with, with the employees, the professionals, and they say, well, we never do that. We, 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 we keep completely away from that. And it was Hall's feeling these people were taxpayers. You know, they're asking a reasonable question. They've lost loved ones in this terrible thing. I, he said, I think we're obligated to, uh, uh, to be responsive. And he sent me to go meet with them. And, uh, and that was the start. We, we had about six or eight meetings of family groups. Uh, and, and some of the stories that they told were really kind of shocking about how human remains were treated, about how they were treated, you know, and, uh, and we knew that, that the country could do better. And, and we developed some draft legislation that was going to codify how family members could expect to be treated. And um, it was being blocked, frankly, by the air carriers. And when TWA occurred, uh, I got drafted to start briefing the family members on the second night. There were four or 500 people in the room speaking three or four, you know, there were at least a hundred French people, right. about 50 Italians. And, uh, it was a, uh, it, it was a challenging assignment. And, uh, I finally got some help from the White House and Bill Clinton and Mrs. Clinton came up and, uh, they, they met with the family members and they turned around and made an announcement that from here on in the NTSB was going to brief family members and that he expected Congress to pass legislation authorizing them and funding them to do so. And that fall, uh, only about three months after TWA, Congress passed the Family Assistance Act, giving uh, the NTSB that authority. And I'm very proud of that, that, that we got that done. Let's do a quick ID, Arnie. Our guest is Peter Galtz. He is the former head of the NTSB and air transportation or transportation expert. I want to fast forward to something recent. January 2nd, a uh, JAL, Japanese airline plane, collided with a Coast Guard aircraft and caught on fire. And all 379 people on board got out in very fast order. So, and it was on all the news. I mean, it was, a, it was an amazing, you know, story to hear. What can you tell us about what really happened and how that all played out? It was, it was an extraordinary uh, event. You know, the, the, uh, the Japanese transportation system employs these wide body aircraft for relatively short haul trips, commuter trips. So, so this was a Airbus A350, usually used for long haul trips, you know, configured for uh, a short haul uh, commuter run. Uh, as you indicated, there was a large number of people on board and uh, it was coming in on its regular scheduled uh, arrival at Haneda Airport. At the same time, a, uh, a, a Japanese Coast Guard uh, aircraft, a, a rescue craft, uh, a de Havilland Otter, was preparing to take off and deliver rescue uh, uh, equipment and supplies uh, to an area of Japan that had just had a serious earthquake. Um, apparently, what the uh, the tower tapes show is that the uh, Coast Guard plane uh, did not adhere or understand the uh, tr air traffic controller's uh, instruction, which was to proceed to taxiway uh, you know, to a certain taxiway and hold short or hold, uh, at the holding area. And, uh, it's not uncommon to get planes lined up. If somebody comes in and lands, you're held at, at the taxiway, then you move out into the, the active runway and you take off. And there were, there were three things that caused, that probably contributed to this accident. One was the pilot, the, uh, Coast Guard pilot may not have been familiar with the airport. He may have been new to the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, to the layout. Secondly, uh, there were blinking lights, uh, 
at these intersections for pilots to see. In this case, those lights were not functioning. Now, that they weren't functioning had been reported and, and, and was part of what they call a NOTAM, which is a notice to airmen or airwomen uh, that pilots are obligated to read before they fly at the airport. Now, we don't know whether yet whether the uh, pilot uh, or co-pilot pulled the NOTAM as required and read it and were cognizant that, that the uh, wigwag lights were not on. And uh, in any case, they pulled out into the active runway as the uh, A350 was coming down and, uh, and the A350 clipped them. And it, you it think, did, yeah, go ahead. Say, do you think that if that happened in the U.S., that 379 people could get off in an orderly fashion? Absolutely not. And here's, 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 here's two things. Here's two things. One is, is, you know, the most dangerous part of your, of your, uh, air, uh, experience is when you're on the taxiways. You know, the, the largest, you know, accident in terms of fatalities was a runway collision between two 747s on the Tenerife Islands. Uh, and, uh, there have been, I think 17 or 18 near misses this year, uh, on wow. runway, what they call runway incursions. And what, what you could see from the videotapes and what you could see from the interviews is that the passengers actually did what the flight attendants instructed. Now the U.S., you know, they don't follow it's chaos, but they, they, they waited. They got off the plane. They, they did not go and grab their overhead bags, which Americans always do. And the, uh, the exit, even though a number of the, uh, of the emergency slides were, were blocked was, was, was pretty good. But that's going to be the main thing. How long did it really take them to get off? They're supposed to be able to exit in 90 seconds. They did not do that. They, they, it took more time. It did take more time. Yep. And it's do you think to, U.S. carriers, do you think, is there a creative way for U.S. carriers to, to, you know, lean into what happened in, with the Japanese passengers and to communicate that well, to U.S. passengers and yes, say, in I, the event, right? Yeah, I think, I think that the, uh, that, that the briefing that flight attendants give, uh, can be a, a little more serious and a little more aggressive because, you know, the, the carriers themselves, they don't want to scare their customers. But the right. reality is, 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 is you need to lay out, uh, uh, the facts on, on what it's going to take to, to survive an accident. And the odds of you surviving now are great because one, the seats in aircraft are what they call 16 G seats now. They will survive a crash. You, they will not, uh, separate from their frames, which is, was one of the real, uh, deadly, uh, events in a, in a runway crash. And mm -hmm. secondly, secondly, the interiors of the plane, uh, when, when things get fire, uh, they don't emit toxic fumes. So, so you can get out. And, uh, the third, the, the, the third thing is, is, uh, flight attendants are extraordinarily well trained now. And they know if you follow their instructions, you'll live. You mentioned something I think that's important, trying to take the presentation to you about how you get off the plane and all of the other things seriously. Because, you know, for seasoned travelers, they don't even listen. They tune out. They listen right. to their I iPhone or whatever. And I noticed I flew on Delta, which is a preferred airline here out of Missoula, and they've done a new introductory video, which is almost like a little movie. It's a comedy you know, right. and while I think they're trying to make people watch it more, it makes it look less serious. You know, I mean, when you take a ship out to sea, they make you do a drill and put on, you know, life vest and all right. that sort of stuff. Yeah, so I think, yeah, I think got, we'll I see think, this. I think we'll see this revisited again after the uh, the, the Japanese accident and which people are going to look at it because it is serious. And, uh, you know, I, I remember the pictures of, uh, uh, after the, uh, U.S. air accident on the Hudson, you know, where, where you had, you know, a, a hundred people standing on the wings and a number of them had their suitcases with them. 
What was that right. about? Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. What is that? Come on, leave your stuff. Get off the plane. Help other people get off. Yeah. I it remember was, since um, Ronald Reagan fired all the, the air traffic controllers, that the shortage of air traffic controllers has been a consistent theme yeah. in the aviation industry. How do you fix that? Well, and it, it, is it a problem? Yeah, there is a shortage. You know, the the uh, the new crop of air traffic controllers that were hired, you know, in the 1980s to replace the, the fired ones are, are aging out. And it is a high stress uh, job. I mean, if you're at one of the one, one, one of the major towers and it's a major, you know, it's a time of heavy flights, you got uh uh, you know, you, you're in the New York area or the Washington area. You've got flights taken off every minute. It is a high stress job and they mm. lose a lot of people. They, they, a lot of people, you know, just wear out. Uh, and it's a job where it takes a considerable amount of training, probably 18 months of, of training. So, uh, the FAA and the, and, the, uh, the air carriers, in fact, have been pushing towards new training programs and, more aggressive recruitment, and uh, so I think I think the shortage on on controllers is is uh, that they're trying to address it. We'll probably get to it. And what you about the same pilots? problem? Yeah, same. I was going to say same problem with pilots. Yeah. Well, that's different, you know, because uh, because the uh, you know the pilot the pilot union Alpa, which is a, a very powerful full union, they're not that all upset about having a shortage of pilots. Because it raises uh, their salaries, and uh, and uh. they they have they have done very well in the last few years on their salary negotiations, but I think there is there is an agreement that that it simply is too expensive and too time consuming for a young person to get into uh, commercial aviation. You know the 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 major uh, hurdle is the Congress and the FAA require 1,500 hours of flying in command. And uh, that's a lot of time. And the, the, there's no evidence that indicates that that 1,500 hours is is more effective than 900 hours. And uh, so th- that's something that's got to be addressed. It's, 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 a, it's almost a third rail right now, but it will be. Uh, because there is a pilot shortage, it's going to get worse. Uh, the military is uh, putting up sizable retention bonuses for, for their pilots. So the stream coming out of the military is not as robust as it used to be. So I think I, I, but, but that issue of pilot training is, is a big one. Peter, two that- part, I have, I have a two part question for you related. Um, when you were the head of the NTSB, social media was not really existent. Um, and now it's how I actually learned about the recent Air Alaska flight where the uh, window, the panel uh, came out. Um, so two parts. One is, is that uh, I've also noticed an awful lot of flight attendants and pilots making their own videos and posting their own videos to TikTok and to Instagram about the day in the life of a pilot or the work that they do, yeah. which is interesting. I'm surprised the airlines aren't more um, – they're not overseeing that more and kind of limiting that because it's kind of a private you know, business experience, right? It's not – I, I don't quite understand it. But the second thing is is that – with the spate of videos that are now out about like the As- the Air Alaska flight, et cetera. The NTSB has always been transparent in its, in its investigations. And, you know, in, in the 1990s, uh, we saw this thing called the Internet, you know, developing. And we <laughs> felt it. We, we, we felt it on TWA 800. We felt it on Egypt Air. But, but we were just seeing the beginnings of it, of it. Now the NTSB has an aggressive social media program. They, uh, they, you know, the Chairman Hamandi, uh, her press briefings are carried live on YouTube. They have their own YouTube channel. She's fabulous, uh, yes. in those things. She's very good. And, uh, uh, 
there isn't there really isn't a, a way in which the the air carriers or anyone else can squash you know flight attendants or anyone else you know pilots uh, you know putting up uh, their their own opinions and that you know there is free speech but it, it makes the investigations challenging the NTSB relies on citizens a lot to send us their videotapes send us what you've seen sure. and uh, you know it's a uh, it's an important part of any investigation now we just touched on the Boeing 737 MAX 9s. So yep. FAA ordered temporary, temporary grounding of all 171 of them. Scott mentioned that a flight in progress had a panel pop off the fuselage and the window wall that, that was associated with that. How does that get resolved? Well, I mean, it was. It was a... Uh... Uh, you know, it was a horrifying event, no question about it. Uh, as, you know, within a, a few hours of, of the plane landing, Alaska had voluntarily grounded its fleet of uh, 75 uh, MAX 9s. And then the FAA the next day uh, grounded the entire national fleet. Uh, this is this is going to be, I don't think, uh, a difficult investigation to find out what happened. Now, why it happened will, 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 will be more complex. But, but what happened, I mean, they've been using these kinds of plugs for decades. You know, in, uh, in any given, uh, any given air, aircraft uh, that's been successful, whether it's a 737 or a 777, uh, they come out in different variations or variants. And uh, they get stretched so that more people can get into it. And when, when you re- reach a certain number of additional seats, you have to have additional exits, emergency exits. And uh, in this, in the MAX 9, uh, I believe Ryanair, uh, a low-cost carrier from overseas, had been a, one of the early launch customers. And they, they had a, a, a seat configuration that triggered the extra exit door. Alaska Airlines, you know, uh, bought at least 75 of them, and, and their configuration is, is different. Their seat pitches are much wider, uh, longer between each other. So so they, they did not need, weren't required to have the extra uh, exit door. So it was plugged and uh, it, it was visible from the outside, but certainly not from the inside. And how these plugs have been secured has been relatively the same uh, over, over the last few decades. So the question is, why did this one uh, door come undone? And in some subsequent investigations of their fleets, people have found carriers United, American, I mean United and Alaska have found some of their some of the um, uh, bolts that was hold that that would hold the plug in place we're not fastened properly. And that's the beginning of the investigation. What happens after that? Uh, I don't know, but that's, that's where the attention is going to be. And this was a, a brand new plane off the line, uh, that Alaska, uh, started flying for just, uh, I think 150 flights. And, uh, so the attention is going to be on Boeing and its subcontractor who produces the fuselage. You know, how did this, how did this plane, uh, fail uh so quickly off the assembly line which by the way arnie we 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 see those fuselages on the trains coming through missoula yes we do they go right to you mentioned trains mentioned trains that's a good segue i want to ask peter one question about uh, something that's more local to us montana is very heavily involved in the concept of commuter rail expansion in montana um They want to uh, basically reopen the northern Hiawatha line in southern Montana. You've traveled around the world. Scott traveled around the world. I've traveled around the world. Commuter rail is much more in in, uh, vogue everywhere. You got you got high speed trains in Europe and Asia. Um, What do you? What's your feeling about the U.S. you know rail industry from a a commuter rail perspective? Well, we've had a, a number of 
of challenges in the in the rail industry. And part of it is is you know Europe Europe went through uh, World War II, uh, and that that you know the Belgian rail lines, French rail lines, German rail lines, virtually started from scratch after World War II, and uh, we we haven't had that kind of devastation. So so our rail lines evolved, and uh, the last time I looked, we had something like. 15,000 at grade, uh, grade crossings. And there's nothing more, more devastating than a grade crossing accident. And we, we've, we allowed the infrastructure, our rail infrastructure, not to advance, uh, the way, um, the, the other, uh, countries, particularly Europe and in parts of Asia, where, where they really have, have, uh, advanced, uh, Mightily. I mean, Japan is, is a tremendous example of high speed rail. But, but remember, I mean, we, we, we bombed them for a good three years. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, they, there wasn't much there in 19, August of 1945, uh, when, when they surrendered. So, uh, it's expensive. Uh, it, uh, it bucks up against the American love of the automobile. Uh, but, in the long run, we have to do it. We've got to invest in our rail infrastructure, both commuter and in uh, and in freight. I think. Peter, on the fifteenth anniversary of the uh, miracle on the Hudson, when U.S. Airways Sully Sullenberger landed the plane safely, a U.S. Airways seven fifty seven, I believe. Thirty seven. Was, was it? Yeah, thirty seven. Yeah, seven thirty seven successfully on the Hudson. Uh, there, I mean, there's documentaries and, and films based on this and stories and books. Tell us what you remember when when that happened and 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 kind of uh, looking back on that. Um, what was it like? You know, well, yeah, I had I had left the safety board, but uh, uh, I was still in close contact with a number of people I'd placed there and uh, the. Uh, head of family assistance uh, was a young woman I'd recruited uh, from the army reception center up in Dover, Delaware. All right. And, um, you know, I watched the, uh, the whole event as all of us did on TV. And I said, boy, this is, I was working for uh, doing some work for CNN at the time. I said, this is just extraordinary. And uh, there, he, he and his flight crew performed magnificently. You know, and uh, I got a call from uh, my former employee who was on scene about the, towards late in the afternoon. And she called me up and she was almost in tears. And she said, I can't. He said, she said, you can't imagine what it's like to go to an accident scene and everybody survived. She said, I just, you know, it just took her breath away. And she said, I'm really, she's, she was really in tears. And she said, I just can't imagine. Everybody made it. And it was, it was an extraordinary event. And Captain Sullenberger and his first officers did an extraordinary job. Um, you know, he, uh, and, uh, you know, the, there was a movie put out that Clint Eastwood, uh, directed, <laughs> right? And it, it was yeah. rather, it was rather, controversial as far as the NTSB was concerned because it portrayed them. Well, it portrayed them as kind of jackbooted, you know, uh, investigators trying to blame it on Sully, on, on, on Captain Sullenberger. Right. And, and, that, and by the way, Tom Hanks, which was, you can't blame yeah, right. him for you, anything. You can't. Who could blame Tom Hanks for a thing? <laughs> and, and it, you know, there, there was a certain, there was a broad amount of liberty that, uh, that, that the great, uh, director uh had taken and and it was not an accurate portrayal of how the ntsb works or how they have hearings and you know that kind of stuff and a rather dramatic license so we we the board i understand complained to uh to eastman and uh, to Clint eastwood and uh and sullenberger visited the board and said well you know i didn't have anything to do with it but i'm sorry you know the way it was portrayed because it wasn't true uh, well, well Clint Eastwood needs 
a villain yeah. in every you right. know every one of his movies. So there wasn't right. a natural villain. So you guys had to become the villain. And it, it it took it took the NTSB just a number of hours to realize that that the Captain Sullenberger had not only made the right choice, he made the only choice, and he was he was viewed uh, as a hero by the NTSB uh, throughout the, the investigative process. You know what I was thinking about is where he landed it on the Hudson. Had he done it <laughs> any further south? And he could have run into some some he could have run into some the uh, Statue of Liberty he could have run. It right. was more. Now it's, right? he, I mean, it was almost he perfect. Have, yeah, he well, we're have, all from he back. Could east. have clipped the George Washington Bridge yeah. coming in. He yes. was very close. Yes, and we're we're all from back east. We've seen the Hudson River many many times. There's usually a lot of traffic on it, and when you're looking at you know from the angle that you're coming in. I can't imagine how we figured there was a safe place to put it down. Yeah, it was a cold day. There weren't a lot of boats out. You know, the he, the, the ferries luckily were, were were not in transit right in front of them. The Jersey uh, ferries, and uh, you know, the, the 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 plane stayed on the surface for a good amount of time. It was just a it was an extraordinary job of airmanship. Of events. Let's take a quick break. Our guest is Peter Galtz, the former head of the of the NTSB, a transportation expert and return guest to What Do You Know? Back after this. Arnie, we are back with our guest, Peter Galtz. One last question, Peter. We talked a lot about what's happening in the United States, but people fly all over the world. What's the condition of the air industry outside of the U.S.? Well, it's growing astronomically and you know, the U S still has the safest system, but it's stretched. And uh, chairman Hammondy mentioned that in a number of her remarks, we need to make further investments into our own system to stay on top. The European system is excellent and reaches, you know, throughout uh, Eastern, you know, out to the, to, to the border of, 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 uh, of Russia. And Asia, depending on the air carrier and the country, you know, uh, Japan Air is wonderful. Korean Air is, is excellent. Singapore is considered one of the <clears throat> finest uh, air carriers. Uh, you need to be careful when you go to the low-cost carriers outside of the U.S., uh, particularly in Asia and Africa. They have less uh, robust safety programs and have a higher rate of accidents. Peter, real quickly, and in less than a minute, how does AI impact this this industry? And what are the you know a couple of things we should think about there? Well, it, it you know the the whole AI revolution is just beginning in aviation, and I think it's going to have you know extraordinary application to how airplanes are are flown. I mean, I know AI is used in our most advanced fighter pilots fighter planes. It's going to come down to commercial carriers as well and will be introduced to air traffic control. It can only help. It can only be a big help. Well, that's a good place to leave this conversation. Arnie, Peter, thank you. Arnie, I will see you next week. See you next week, Scott. Peter, you're always an entertaining, interesting, and informative guest. Good to see you guys. I enjoy it. Thank you for listening to What Do You Know? I can't wait for the next show, Scott. I'm excited too, Arnie. If you'd like to suggest a guest, send me an email at scottrichman at townsquaremedia.com. We'll see you next week. And thanks for listening to News Talk KGVO. Hey guys, time to get in on the action for the biggest moments in basketball with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections, place your entry, and win up to 100 times your money. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use the code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy.